Okay. Uh, there you go. It's looking good, Jay. Oh. Okay. It's going like that. Okay. Sorry about that. You can have some migraines, by the way. Cool. Someone needs to mute. Some fucking bug. Better? Hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. It looks All good, right. Jay. All right, I'm, I'll launch it, I'll go. All right, so Sam has suggested, uh, rather than just talking about the mushrooms of Georgia, uh, people might be interested in uh, hearing a little bit about mushrooms of the uh, Southeast. So that's what I'm gonna talk about and we're going to start, we're going to look at the three different seasons, spring, summer, and the fall, and look at some examples of, of each one of those. So uh, this is just a map I found someplace dividing the United States, and it can be useful for actually looking at the different regions where different mushrooms will uh, are known to occur. And of course, what we find here in the southeast would be different than what they find in the Midwest because the trees are, are different and the temperatures are a little bit cooler. So just wanted to show you that. Usually uh, this is sort of an extended version, I guess, of, of the Southeast. Some locations or, or some places will just limit it to about 10 states. This is about 13 states, including Maryland, but uh, some people truncate that and, and some people leave Florida out of the Southeast because they have very unique uh, uh, flora down there, very unique trees and the temperatures a lot hotter. But for purposes tonight, we can probably look at that uh, that area, about uh, 12 states there, look at. Uh, one book I will uh, recommend, it's called Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast States. When I go through the presentation tonight and talk about the different groups of the fungi, if there's a good source that, that that uh, I know of, I will show you a picture of it and, and uh, talk about it a little bit. And just to give you an idea of, of uh, good resources, a couple of the books by the Bassets on the Bolites, and another one I think that I'm, I'm recommending that you might want to get. Now, the a picture of this map that you see is in the mushrooms of the Gulf Coastal States. They they, those are the states they consider to be the Gulf Coastal states. But this book has a lot of utility. It has a, 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 covers a lot of mushrooms. And there, many of them I found in Arkansas, Missouri, and Tennessee, and North Carolina. So it's not just limited to the Gulf Coast states. But some of the, sometimes some of the mushrooms that I find are only found in, in the Texas and then along the Gulf Coast. But I would recommend uh, that you might want to consider getting that one also, even even for Georgia. Okay, um, <clears throat> so how many mushrooms could you expect to encounter when you're out foraging? Well, a recent source that I found said maybe there's 56,700 worldwide, and but 10,000 of those are described from North America. So this is just sort of a breakdown of if you go out and pick, uh, say, 100 mushrooms, what you might uh, uh, come to expect as far as which ones you could eat and which ones you can't eat. So about half of them will be inedible. They're just too tough to chew. Uh, some of them will be bitter or acrid tasting, which doesn't cook out. There'll be some, about 25% may be edible, but not incredible edibles, just, just tasteless. 20% of them can make you sick, irritate your digestive system. Only 4% will be excellent tasting ones. And then of course, the dark side of uh, eating mushrooms is 1% of the total can be lethal, meaning uh, it, could, it could kill you. All right, I'm gonna do a little bit of intro uh, learning or teaching, I should say. And, and I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, the, what, what I use the term macro fungi, rarely do I, I use, well, sometimes I use mushrooms, sometimes I use uh, fungi, but, but a lot of times on fleshy fungi, I just call them macro fungi. And the macro fungi are made up of the uh, members of the two different uh, phyla, Escomycota, Basidiomycota. Fungi, the kingdom fungi can be divided into about seven or eight different phyla. And the Escomycota and Basidiomycota 
are the most uh, highly developed uh, by virtue of their differentiation of their cells and the way that they, they make their spores. So members of these two phyla uh, are commonly known as the macrofungi and literally they are the poster children of the kingdom fungi. That's what people think of when you, when you talk about, uh, if you mention the term fungi, unless of course they've got a fungal infection between their toes and that's probably more what they're thinking of. But, but normally with normal people, you know, they, that's what they would gravitate or mentally uh, 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 project in their mind. It, uh, a fungus would be mushroom or, or, or related fungus. Okay, so ecologically, the macro fungi can be divided into three different categories based on how they obtain their nutrients. Fungi cannot make their own food, so they have to get uh, a food from some other source. From uh, And this is the way, this is three different avenues that, that they have evolved to uh, obtain food. Uh, the smallest group, uh, meaning the, the smallest diversity or, or the group that contains the smallest number of these fungi are called parasitic. But they're some of the most interesting ones in that they parasitize insects or insects relative, relative, excuse me, like spiders. And also they use the term parasitic is used for fungi that possess the ability to invade trees. The second largest uh, group are what we call the decomposers. These are your shiitakes, your, your uh, oysters, and some other things called polypores that grow on wood. They go in and uh, consume the uh, uh, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignans inside the, the wood. This is the most diverse group uh, in, of, of the fungi in nature. The largest group, which, which um, are said to be mycorrhizae, I'm going to show you an example of that in a few minutes. Uh, this is the largest. These are the forest mushrooms where Whereas there are a few mushrooms that you'll find on the lawns that are eating the dead grass and maybe eating some wood and stuff. The largest group that we have are the ones that are associated with trees. And manitas, chanterelles, boletes, all those are obligate uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi. So just to show you some pictorial uh, uh, examples of each um, members of each of this group, these are the parasitic fungi. This is the fungus that's growing on uh, an ant right here has uh, compromised the ant, the ant's dead, and then the fungus is growing from its uh, head, I think. This is Cordyceps militaris, which is actually can be cultivated now in the lab and, and people use it medicinally. This one is growing on a June bug. Uh, many of y'all may have eaten the lobster mushroom. This is an acid seed that's growing on a basidial mushroom. This one at the bottom here actually grows in my yard. It shows it's been showing up every year. It grows on a large beetle larvae, but it hasn't actually been named yet, but there's a grad student at uh, Oregon State that's been working with, with this group for quite a long time. I think as soon as he publishes uh, his work, he, he will give it an official name, it will be officially published. The one on uh, this side of the screen on the far right is one that's growing on a false truffle right there, another type of what used to be cordyceps, but it's in a different genus now. Decomposed sometimes can be quite uh, colorful. This is a crust fungus growing on a log here. Nice purple in the royal blue uh, crust fungus right here growing on this branch. And then some other shell fungi on the top, false turkey tail, sterium complicatum. Those are all examples and, and kind of showy and colorful of decomposers. Okay. This is your ecological lesson for tonight if you're not aware of, of uh, what uh, ectomycorrhizae is and how it's uh, very important in, in the world and in, in the ecology of, of everything. So ectomycorrhizae is a combination of probably three, I think, Greek derived words. Ecto means outside. Myco is just a buzzword for fungus and rhizae can be associated with roots. So taken all together, the term ectomycorrhizal means fungus growing outside of the root of a tree. And there's a partnership between meat fungi and the basidial mycota and escomycota and woody plants, those usually being uh, trees and shrubs. So here's a pictorial example of, of what I was talking about. 
you can see on the far left is a, a saprotrophic fungus, a decomposer, and its mycelium is spreading out, but it's only getting with the fallen leaves. And it's, but the ectomycorrhizal fungus right here, its mycelium has spread out. It's interconnecting with the rootlets of the tree right there. It's not invading the rootlets, but it's sort of wrapping its mycelium around the roots and it's siphoning off uh, carbohydrate, sugars. But in return, it gives the tree an increase of surface area of the rootlets. And it also has been shown to uh, 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 give the tree some minerals. It, it sort of breaks down some, uh, uh, I guess, uh, non-soluble compounds of phosphorus and, and sometimes nitrogen, it breaks them down to where the tree can, can uh, benefit from that. So that's the big, how should I say, the big, uh, um, arrangement between trees and fungi. That's that's the fungus doing its job. Now, if we come along and we cut the tree out, the fungus uh, won't have its food source anymore, so it dies. That's, that's why what we're picking is just the fruiting bodies of the fungus. We pick them, uh, the mushrooms that we pick are just the fruiting bodies of the fungus. The whole vegetative state is buried underground and, and we hardly ever see it. But if the tree dies, then uh, the fungus will not have a food source anymore. So you won't see any more fruiting bodies, they're gone. If something happens to the soil, say acid rain, or it becomes too acidic and the fungus dies, well then the tree won't be getting its, its uh, uh, minerals anymore. Then the, sur the uh, surface area of the rootlets will be de decreased and everything. So eventually it could die also. So it's a wonderful relationship uh, that has developed between fungi and, uh, and trees. And there's other associations too of uh, different types of plant, uh, uh, plant and fungal associations. We could do a whole program on that, but it's interesting. If you're interested, you can find that, that information. Okay, so we're gonna look at the, the pretty pictures and look, look at the uh, mushrooms of the three different seasons. So you can read up there, I say spring has the smallest diversity, but they do have some interesting and colorful macro fungi. Summer has the second largest diversity and features its own unique type of uh, macro fungi. And the fall seasons offers the largest diversity. So spring mushrooms and fungi. All right, so in the spring, we see a lot of what's in the phyla esco uh, uh, mycota right here, the little cup fungi. And that's what I'm showing you here, right here. It's a physiza up here. And here's one that's sort of hair, uh, fuzzy on there and the uh, Vosporella on the wood. Here's another little cup fungus here. And here's one that's bluish green, Chlorosuborea right there. And also, this is a fungus that I call the harbinger of spring. Common name for it is the devil's urn. And this is what it looks like uh, when it's real young. It looks sort of like little fingerlings or at least, you know, club shaped, really small shaped fungi. And then as it matures, uh, it opens up. You can see the opening developing right there. And at the end, it has, uh, I mean, excuse me, when, when it's mature, it opens up more. It looks like a little goblet or maybe a wine glass. And one of the fun things um, uh, you can do with it if you're in the woods and recognize it, if it's uh, open up completely like, like the uh, seeing in the photograph up there, is you can take out some of your drinking water out of your, your uh, uh, a cup or your, your bottle, you can pour some in there and sort of maybe get attention from your other people in the, in, that you're hiking with or walking with and you just take a little sip from it. Use it as a drinking cup is what I'm saying. So people that are uninitiated uh, and think that all fungi might be poisonous might be shocked if you do that. But uh, it's kind of, you know, it's, it, it's good for one little, one little parlor trick, I guess, so to speak. An interesting thing about the uh, cup fungi is they have the ability to simultaneously discharge their spores. So usually, and it's usually triggered by uh, moist uh, air. So what I did to capture this photograph, that's not my lens being a uh, mask or being cloudy or whatever. Uh, what I actually did, I set up my camera and I blew hot air across all these cup fungi and they all discharge their spores simultaneously like that. So I thought that that was kind of neat, but it's a neat trick. Going back, you can also do the same thing with these devil's urns. 
if you find them out there, if you pick one and it's mature, you can run your finger uh, down into the, the uh, bowl part or whatever, and then remove it. And sometimes it will discharge, uh, simultaneously discharge a lot of spores. Kind of looks like smoke coming up from it. Another, another way to have fun with fungi. Okay, okay, I'm sure some of y'all recognize those. That's our, our uh, probably most, one of the most popular and widely known uh, wild mushrooms that people all over the country will, will um, how should I say, work themselves up into a frenzy uh, talking about them for nine months of the year and then they actually go out in early spring and, and can find them. So we've got uh, th the one up in the left corner up here is the, the black morels. Um, Morels come in, I guess, usually two, two groups. They're called blonde morels, blondes or yellows, or they're called blacks. This is a black morel up here, the most common one uh, in this part of the country, uh, um, Angustus Alps, is, uh, excuse me, Morkella Angustus Alps is its name. And it's fairly common. I found them in Arkansas, Missouri, around ash trees, in other parts of the country, uh, they find them uh, in, uh, under different trees. Tulip poplars are good. these little small ones right here. Going down underneath the black one is the one called half free morels. Uh, usually I find them around ash trees too. The yellow morel in Arkansas, Missouri, I usually find around uh, cottonwoods, eastern cottonwood trees along rivers and streams where it's, it's, it's really wet. This one is a smaller morel. This is called Morkella diminutiva. And they can sometimes be found around tulip poplar trees in, in Tennessee, North Carolina. I still find them around ash in, in uh, Arkansas, Missouri. This is a picture showing a cut, a, a bisected uh, example of the half free morel showing that it does have under, inside it does have a, a connection, a membrane that goes from the cap uh, goes from the stem to the cap. Right here, the bottom one is showing that uh, true morels are all hollow inside. This is a yellow morel. It's been bisected and you can see where it's completely hollow inside. And oh, I just wanted to uh, let you know about this in case you didn't know. Out in, out in the Western part of the United States, Pacific Northwest, uh, Washington, California, uh, Oregon, places like that, a lot of people line up and um, a look at maps where they had the recent forest burns like in the fall or whatever and they line up to go look for morels. There's a there's many they have much more species of uh, black morels out, out in the western part of the United States than we do in the eastern. But um, after the big fire at uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park in 2012, um, the group of research scientists got a a NSF grant and they did some work. They, they visited up at the um, oh, uh, uh, biological station up there in Gatlinburg. They congregated, met, and they discovered uh, this black morel coming out in the area there. And lo and behold, it wasn't a new species of morels. It, it, of morel. it was known in Europe, but this was the first time, one of the first times it had been found in uh, North America. It was, it was also found in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, in 2012. So I just wanted to show you, there was a paper written and published in 2017. I just wanted to show you that. It's kind of a large black morel, but uh, I just thought that was interesting that yes, even in the Eastern part of North America, there are at least one black morel that will show up after a, a big forest fire. Okay, so we also have false morels. Some of you may recognize these. Uh, in the southeast part of the U.S., the two most common ones are this Gyromitra carolandiana, which as you may guess from the name, it was actually just named from uh, the holotype or the original specimen was found in uh, one of the, either North or South Carolina. I can't remember right now. But they get, they get uh, rather large and you can see the bisected uh, specimen right here that's been cut into that it's not completely hollow. It has chambers inside. Uh, these are fairly, they grow kind of slowly. So they usually come out uh, before the true morels come out and they grow 
slowly so that you can find them over a period of weeks, literally. And the one on the left is another one, Gyromitra brunia. It's probably the second most common one that you can find in the Southeast. Uh, there are other species of Gyromitra in other parts of the country, up in the Northern states, there's Gyromitra esculenta. The Western part of the United States has several species also that are different, different than these. Uh, also, we have some little saddle shaped things that are morel relatives. I just threw them up there to, to let you know there's, there's uh, some other types of uh, Ascomycota, Ascomycotina, excuse me, uh, members that show up in the spring. These have a fluted stipe. This is the genus Habella. You can see three different representatives. And then on the far right, it's a little thing called Burpa conica. There are probably only about two species of Burpa known in North America. This is the Eastern ones they are called little thimble caps. And I don't see them every time I'm out uh, morel hunting, every, every season, but every once in a while I find, I do find some of them. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to the summer. Uh, sometimes when I do a uh, presentation, I've, I have many of them. I do a, I can do a whole present. I have presentations uh, that I've done in the past on just the genus Amanita, just on boletes and chanterelles. And then there's another one that I do on summer mushrooms and I call it the ABCs uh, of the, the mushrooms and it's Amanitas, boletes and chanterelles. So that's kind of what I'm gonna uh, show you tonight is examples of, of those three biggies because a lot of people are interested in them, they find them and uh, it, they're very, it's appropriate for that time of the year. So, okay. Uh, Amanitas are um, showy mushrooms. Um, what should I say? But everybody sees them and I'll show you the examples I show you, you'll, many of you will recognize them. But uh, the features that all Amanitas have, they all have a universal veil, but that universal veil can be uh, expressed in two different ways. It can be membranous or non-membranous. I'll show you examples in a few minutes of what that actually means. Most of them have a partial veil and they all have uh, uh, white spores. All Amanitas have white spores. So this, this is on the left is a, an example of Amanita with a membranous universal veil. And if you see at the bottom, what looks like a little uh, turtle or snake egg, uh, it's been bisected and you can out actually see the outline of a mushroom. Well, that's an Amanita button right there. It's completely enclosed in what they, uh, it's called the universal veil. That's the way that universal veil um, is displayed or is, is uh, how should I say it, is uh, intact or uh, the way that particular group of Amanitas grow. They're completely enclosed in that membranous uh, universal veil there. And as the mushroom uh, sucks up water, it expands, it pokes through the top of that universal veil. And what we see at the bottom is called a saccade vulva. And that's the remnants of the membranous universal veil. On the right side of the screen, you will notice there is no saccate vulva at the base of that amanita. But what it's composed of, the universal veil is composed of, is still a covering, but it completely encompasses the uh, amanita, but, but it, it fragments, it's non-membranous. So when the cap starts to expand, the little fragments move away from each other like that. And that's what forms what we call the velar warts. So there you have the example of the membranous universal veil and then the non-membranous universal veil. Okay, there, um, there is one book out on uh, Amanitas. Uh, it's called Amanitas of North America. Uh, it covers about a hundred species. It's, it's uh, written by Britt Bunyard and myself. We, we had a good time writing it and it has some lovely pictures of Amanitas in it. But for just, I guess, hardcore, science, uh, this, this is where you would want to go to study the genus Amanita. It's called uh, Manitaceae, which is the family that the Amanitas are in, manitaceae.org. Now, it uh, was developed and maintained by Dr. Rod Tullis, who's the, a world authority on, on Amanitas. And it, I'm not going to tell you it's, it's uh, 
it's not totally user friendly in that you just can't go in and it, a big dichotomous key and get to your Amanita. But if you can learn what the features are on the seven sections of Amanitas, and he does a, a good job of showing you what the features are. If you can get in your head what the, fe the features on each of the seven sections, then you can go in, you can filter out all possibilities of the other sections and it makes looking for what your particular Amanita may be a little bit easier. I'll just put it to you that way. But that's that's the one source. And uh, he uh, right now there's over a thousand, about 1,064 species of Amanita on a worldwide basis. But uh, I guess I, I would add the southeast part of North America or the United States is the hotbed for Amanitas because it contains the largest diversity of Amanita, the largest number in North America and maybe even in the entire world. So we have literally hundreds of uh, Amanita species in uh, the southeastern part of the United States. Uh, here's some names that I've, I've listed. Uh, these are some common Amanitas that we'll find in the southeast part of the United States uh, during the summertime. Uh, I'll just, I'll show you examples of some of them as we go by. Manita flavoconia, uh, I'm sure as many of you will recognize. It has that uh, yellowish to yellowish orange color on the cap and it has some remnants of the universal veil. It has a non-membranous universal veil you can see on top of the cap right there. It's fairly common and it's one of the first Amanitas I see and uh, usually late May in Arkansas. So you guys would see it in Georgia or other parts of uh, deeper south, you would see it earlier than I would, but uh, very common, lots, uh, yeah. The other two, some of you may be familiar with, they also have a non-membranous universal veil, Amanita flavo rubens, called the yellow blusher, and you can see the velar material on top of the cap there. It also has a red, reddish brown bruising reaction. If you if you rub the stipe like that or scratch it with a knife or whatever, then slowly it will change that uh, to a reddish brown color, more of a reddish, I guess. The one on the right in Europe is called the blusher. It's called Amanita rubescens in Europe, but Rod Tullis has determined that the European Amanita that this one looks like does not occur in, in uh, North America. So he's renamed uh, some, and he calls them the uh, Amanita amera rubescens complex. There's more than one there in that species complex. Now, some of you will probably recognize the, or something similar to the one you see on the right of this screen. This has a membranous universal veil as displayed by the saccate vulva at the base of uh, this mushroom. On the left is the true uh, Caesar's mushroom, Amanita uh, caesarea. Uh, that does not occur in North America. For many years, people thought it did. They thought these things were the same thing, but spore size is different. And once the, the uh, sequencing techniques came along, people started using that, it was definitely proven that uh, uh, the true uh, Caesar's mushroom does not occur in North America. So the earlier literature, people found these and they called them the Amanita caesarea, but uh, we know that uh, it's not the same thing. Here's another example showing of it. Um, now there's people will see these on Facebook groups, ID groups, and they wanna call them all Amanita Jacksonii, which, which is not the correct uh, determination because they're, it's uh, that, what you see up above is what I've written in that it's an Amanita in the Stirps Hemibapa. Stirps is just a taxonomic designation Below section where a group of, of commonly, a group of related uh, species is, are clustered together. So Rod, this is what Rod has at his website. He has a, a group called Sturbs Hemibapa. So even though people on the Facebook groups will call them Emanita jacksonii, there's some other ones that, that are lookalikes uh, for this. So they're not all Emanita jacksonii. But, and also the, the flip side of that is we have the deadly poisonous ones. These are called the destroying angels. And now it's been discovered that they also are, there's more than one different kind. So on the far left, you can see a young uh, 
fruiting body there. You can see the, the saccade bulb at the base. Are no warts on top of the cap on this one. It's pure white. And in the middle, sort of a family portrait showing the, the different uh, growing stages of it, young ones all the way up to older ones. And on the right is just another example of, of two of the specimens. The one in the summer, uh, probably the small one in the, in the middle of the summer is probably Amanita bosporagera. Uh, but in the fall, we see, we see some of these also, but they're larger, they're more robust, and they can be different species. But they're all deadly poisonous, by the way. Uh, just a couple of more examples, Amanita spreta, Amanita abrupta that we can find also in the summer. Beautiful little Amanita, uh, Amanita rosea tinta. It's beautiful because the color is, when it's, it's young, the color is sort of a peach, sort of a pinkish color. And if you look closely, you will see two different kinds of universal veil on this Amanita. You'll see the large pyramidal warts on top that usually fall off after a while. Then it has a very fine uh, mealy uh, uh, second, secondary universal veil that covers it right here. On the left, you can see sort of a family portrait or a, 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 a scene in time where they have put a young one on the far left uh, with more intense colors. And then I found some other examples. And as you see that, that fine mealy universal veil material washes off fairly easily. It also oxidizes, which happens in a lot of mushrooms that, that the intense colors are, you only see them when they're really young because once the sun hits them, it starts to oxidize the pigments on top. That's why purple mushrooms, you find some that are purple and they oxidize to brown colorations or yellowish brown colors because of the sun. But a, a beautiful uh, mushroom was described from down near Biloxi, Mississippi back in the 30s, I think. And it, I know it, these were taken in Arkansas. So I know it goes all the way up through Arkansas and I've seen it in Texas and Louisiana. And I've, I think I've seen pictures on Facebook of people that found them in Georgia. Uh, one last example of, of Amanitas. Uh, here's some that's showing the uh, kind that uh, this has a non-membranous universal veil with the velar warts on top. And sometimes the warts will kind of coalesce or stick together and almost look at what people call velar patches. And then the one on the far right is one that has a membranous type of uh, universal veil. Okay, so we're going to leave Amanitas and look about bolides now. So bolides are those mushrooms that have both a flesh layer and usually the underneath of the cap, they have a layer of tubes. There are a few that will actually have gills instead of pores. And they're divided in at least 87 different genera on a worldwide basis. Most of them are thermophilic, meaning that they're found in the summer. And while they won't kill you, uh, there are no known deadly poisonous ones that I know of in North America. Uh, some of them can cause GI upset. So here's what, uh, the, here's some example, um, or, excuse me. Here's a list of information that we need to gather together to get if we're going to try to ID bolides. So it's always good to get an example of both a young and a, a old specimen. A mature one, we need to see what the host tree is, the ecology of where we find it, color of the spore print, as with uh, the gill mushrooms can be an important consideration. And they do some chemical tests with ammonium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, ferrous sulfate on the top of the cap and the flesh. Uh, if you go to, if you ever use uh, mushroomexpert.com, Michael Quo's a really good uh, website. He does a lot of experimentation or checking with ammonium hydroxide and with ferrous sulfate. So, and then we can actually taste the flesh. We need to know if it's mild or bitter, especially if we're gonna uh, decide we wanna eat it and the appropriate literature. And here's the best um, uh, book that I know out for bullies. It, it's a Bassett book written with uh, Bill Rudy. I think it came out in 2017 or something like that. Uh, but it's it's for the Eastern North America, and it's it's one of the best. It's it's the one I would buy if you want to study bolides, and I would recommend you get one because there's a couple of sites on the internet, but they're not. This book has a lot more information. I think you get a lot of mileage if you want to study bolides. They're really 
they're actually more difficult to identify than gill mushrooms. It's, it's really a challenge sometimes because there's a lot of variation in the way that they look. But it's a fun game to do. Okay, just some examples. Some bolets you will see that will have oops. I'm sorry, though, uh, that will be yellow colored underneath. This one's intensely yellow there. This uh, slide here shows the, the both the flesh and the tube layer. Sorry about that. Shows both the flesh and the tube layer. And you can see the flesh layer has little holes in it like that. Well, that's not genetic expression of the bolete. That's where little bugs have uh, have crawled in and eaten some of the flesh. And that's the reality of picking bolets in the south. Yes, we can find them. Uh, we can find edible ones, but sometimes the bugs get to them before we can get to them. So you find one looks like that, you identify it correctly as an edible one, then you still have to ask yourself that question, how much extra protein do I really want if I eat that mushroom? And obviously if it's really infested, you don't want to eat it at all. But these are three examples of three bolets that have uh, yellowish pores. There's also some that have red pores like that. And some actually have white pores, at least when they're young, they have white pores. This one you see is doing a staining reaction. It's, it's uh, becoming black, actually becomes red before it develops a black color. But this is a Tilophilus. This one's a good edible, by the way. <laughs> you can't always tell just from, you know, sometimes by the way it looks. This one on the left is also a good edible. The, the tubes will change to a, um, a sort of a yellowish brown color as it matures. And another thing that we look on the bolates, we look for features that are on the stalk. The one, this on the left is called reticulation. It looks like somebody's taken a fishnet, just sort of stretched it out and sort of adhered it or stuck it on this stalk, but that can be an important feature. Sometimes on some of the uh, bolates, they, they, in the bolete book will mention, does this reticulation uh, go all the way to the top or does it only go halfway? Those are characteristics that can help uh, determine which species it might be. On another group uh, called Lexinum, we have, instead of reticulation, we have little uh, punctates, we have things that are called scabers. These scabers can, will darken with age or sometimes if the, they're roughed up, they will also darken. So that can be, those are features that we look for bolete. Another feature that many bolete's have is that if you cut them, in half, they instantly stain a, a deep blue color, like this one is showing right here. The pores will also stain blue on some bullet. So we look for the presence or absence of that reaction also. And uh, there's a couple of bolets that I don't want to leave out since I'm, I brought up the subject of bolets. Uh, this one is called Old Man of the Woods, called Strobilomyces. It has very flocos, very woolly type of warts on top of the cow. And it's kind of an interesting fungus. We have uh, at least three species in North America, and I think only one has a good name. Our, the European names that people are using for, our, for this particular group of bolich doesn't really work well. The DNA has shown that they're actually different species. But here I've cut into a specimen of it, and you can see it's bruising a reddish coloration and that will change to black. That will further oxidize to a black color. Interesting one. The other beautiful, it sort of looks like a Strobilomyces um, also, but it's in the genus of uh, uh, Boletellus right here. This is a, even though it's listed as a Gulf Coastal species, I found it in Arkansas one time. It really surprised me. I didn't expect to see it. But this was taken, I think, somewhere in uh, uh, Mississippi. I'm sorry, maybe around Vicksburg, Mississippi, I'm sort of thinking. But you can see it. It also has a woolly type of scales. They're actually coalescing hairs on top of the cow. Beautiful pink color like that. And you can see that the uh, tubes underneath are um, bruising a blue color. Bolitellus nananus. All right. Look at amanitas, we looked at bolete, we're going to look at chanterelles right now. So I, sometimes I think I'm swimming against the stream because I consider both members of the genus cantharellus and craterellus, I've called them both chanterelles. Some people exclude the genus 
craterilla, excuse me, and they don't call them chanterelles, but I do. So what we're looking at, the difference being that members of the genus craterellus, uh, they can be many of them, the ones that you may be familiar with, the craterellus phalaxes has a deep black color, but they can be colored uh, orangish yellow, but uh, they will be hollow in the center. The, the ones that looks like, the ones that look like cantharellus, I'll show you a picture at the end, uh, have a perforation in their caps and at maturity, their uh, stalks will be completely hollow. So both uh, members of this genera are widespread in their distributions and all of them are, or most of them are considered to be excellent wild edibles. So not any that are known to contain toxins. One of the features of the chanterelles, I want you to look up here that uh, it says est estimated to be 25 species in the Eastern United States, but the West, Western states only have five species. So we're rich in chanterelles. Compare this to, there's only like eight species in Europe. So we have quite a few chanterelles. The downside of that, it makes it very difficult if you're trying to key them into species based on macroscopic properties. It's not, we used to think it was easy when we only had maybe 10 or so species. We thought we were smart, we can do it. But I'm here uh, to tell you today that it can't be done anymore in all cases. In some cases it can be. Uh, the, one, uh, the two features that are present in a lot of species of uh, cantharellus is that they will have these wider uh, gills. They'll, they'll be blunt on the edge, edge of them to the knife edge, and they'll be thicker. Many of them have these little veins that run between those gills. And a lot of times they'll be conspicuously forked at the uh, um, end of the gills right here where they, where they connect to the cap. You can see this forking phenomena that we're looking at right here. Um, many of them do not have those little veins uh, between the gills, but many of them do. This particular species does. Okay, so this is an image of the Cantharellus siberius. It appears in North America, and you know there, you notice there's not a picture of a mushroom there. That's that's on purpose because I just want to get the concept uh, across to you that uh, Cantharellus siberius does not occur in North America. And then I put in that um, uh, quote, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, which is true. I mean, I can't, you can't prove a negative. I can't prove it doesn't exist, but based on what I've read, uh, based on what the, the sequencing has told the scientists, they say we have not found any specimens of Cantharellus uh, in North America that match the sequencing of the known European um, uh, Siberia. So, I know some of the older books will, will tell you that Cantharellus siberius occurs in North America, but I'm telling you tonight that based on what I've read and seen, it does. So just older literature. Okay, here are some that uh, I know to be present in the uh, Southeast. I think I counted about 13 different uh, uh, species there. Some of them can be easily ID'd. Uh, Cantharellus lewisii uh, can be ID, Cantharellus minor can be fairly easy ID just on the macroscopic properties, but some of them can't be. And I've put them into different categories, the yellow colored caps and ones that have brown colored caps and then the red color species. Okay, they, here's uh, two of them that uh, even though the photo may not look the same, they're very difficult to distinguish one from the other. Uh, Cantharellus flavus, obviously from the yellow color. Even though it was described from La Crosse, uh, Wisconsin, it's known to be down in the south. It's known to go as far as south as Texas. The Tanuathrex on the right was actually described from Texas. I'm uh, not sure how far north that it may go, but uh, it was described from Eastern Texas. Uh, here's two that cannot be told, cannot, you cannot tell them apart just based on the macroscopic properties. Uh, Cantharellus latericius, which uh, is an old, uh, excuse me, it's, it's a well-known uh, chanterelle, it's called the smooth chanterelle. Then a couple of years ago, it was discovered that um, 
I'm sorry, a couple of years ago, we discovered there's a lookalike that's called flavolaterisia. Sometimes they're a little bit smaller, but uh, uh, the original literature says you can't tell them apart except by the looking at the DNA sequences. And here's an interesting phenomenon. We've got one mushroom, but it has at least two different forms, maybe three different forms. There's a yellow form that looks like lateritious. The seberioid form was actually found in Arkansas and it looks more robust than the lateritious forms, but it could have been, it's a younger uh, collection. So it, it could, it, those could be the same. The DNA says they're all the same species. And here's one over here called the pink uh, colored form that's uh, known from uh, uh, Asheville. And it's not known from the deep South, but Tennessee, Asheville and Alabama, I've seen some collections of pictures of down there. So it has at least two different forms, maybe three, but the DNA says it's all the same species. So this was a situation they had in Europe for a long time. They had something like 24 individual species of, of cantharellus over in Europe. Then they started sequencing what they found and they found out they really didn't have 24 different species, but they only had eight. They were just showing, showing up in different forms. A couple of ones that have brown caps, the Appalachiensis over here on the left, and then the Cantharellus lewisii over here. This one actually has purple brown coloration when it's real young, it's really beautiful. And the purple colorations are oxidized very quickly to, to brown colors. An interesting one that was described from uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, it's called Juventate viridis. Viridis comes from the greenish color. This one actually has highlights or has sort of an olivaceous green color on top of the cap. As it matures, the olivaceous color sort of fades away, but it will hang around on the margin of, of the cap. So this is sort of an olive green color one. And it's probably a, maybe be a deep south um, uh, species. I don't know. Like I say, it was described from material and found in Mississippi, uh, Southern Mississippi and Louisiana, but, but uh, it, it's kind of a neat one because it has that olivaceous color to it. Here's uh, three different uh, mushrooms that are sometimes people find them and they mistake them for chanterelles. Um, two out of three, it's, it's no harm, no foul. Uh, the one on the left is called Geronema strombodes. We know it's not a chanterelle because number one, it's growing on wood. It does have that, that funnel shape uh, uh, morphology that's characteristic of, of a lot of chanterelles, but uh, and it will have a white spore print color. But uh, we can tell, uh, but if we look closely at the gills, we can see that they're knife heads, they're not blunt. So if people eat that, you know, uh, it, it's okay. The other one obviously looks so much like a chanterelle, it was even named that the species was called cantharellus. It's a hygrosophy. You can see the gills are, are decurrent, they're a little bit thicker, and people have picked these thinking they picked small red cap chanterelles. Again, no harm, no foul. You know, you, you misidentified it, but it's not gonna hurt you. Now the third one, which is called the jack-o'-lantern fungus, is called Omphalotus alludens. It grows on wood. Sometimes they, get, uh, they will get a darker color, become a nice orange color. And if people eat this one, uh, it's more than just making a, a misidentification. They can, they will get sick. Uh, most people will get sick from eating this one. So again, you know, just a reminder to make sure, you know, 100% uh, the identity of the mushroom you're eating. Uh, these are the black trumpets, uh, very, they have a fruity aroma uh, when they're fresh. Uh, these can be actually dry, the flesh is so thin that people can dry these and reconstitute them later. They're great in pasta, they're great with eggs and like that. And they have the, the shape of a, a funnel or a um, uh, trumpet. Uh, in, in some cultures, that's why they're called black trumpets, obviously. Okay, so this is the genus Craterellus, I'm sorry. We've left uh, the, the genus Cantharellus and we're starting to look at members of the genus Craterellus. Here's a yellow, uh, species of a craterellus. This is called craterellus ignicolor, and it's not too uncommon 
uh, in the southeast. I've seen lots of uh, fruitings of it. But if you look closely, if you look in the middle of the cap there, it's got a little perforation, it's got a little hole, and the stipe on this one will be completely hollow. So that's how we know that it's, it's a member of the genus Craterellus rather than Cantharellus. Sometimes they will have a violaceous or purplish or, or lilac, I shouldn't say uh, purplish, but lilac colored uh, gills when they're young. All right, so that's the ABCs, the Amanitas, the Boletes, the Chanterelles, we're going on to other summer fungi. Many of y'all have seen lots of Rushulas. We see red cap rushulas usually begin around, actually I had some out in my yard with my pine trees about uh, three weeks ago before the big freeze hit. And we see them almost uh, nine, 10 months of the year in Arkansas. So down there, y'all may see them a little bit longer, but we have red cap ones, which almost impossible to identify just macro using macroscopic properties. We have green cap ones, which are a little bit easier in, in some cases to ID on macroscopic properties. Uh, we get the ecological data, look at the, uh, at least the color of the spore print can help. Then we have some white cap ones. Uh, here's some also, we have a beautiful uh, yellow cap rusula called rusula flavida that's uh, fairly common in the summertime. And we have the rusula compacta. This one sort of has a fishy aroma to it. And if you bruise the gills, it sort of strains to a brownish coloration. Uh, who's brown. Here we have kind of two unique ones, Russula eccentrica, sort of has odor, a chemical odor, or one like a swimming pool. I don't see it too often. Over here, we have a weird genus called Multiperca, and it used to be um, called Russula. Some of them were called Russula, some of them were called uh, Lactarius. It's sort of a genus that sort of uh, species that are in between, that have, have characteristics of, of Russulas and Lactarius, even though they're in the same family. So it was taken out of, this one used to be in the genus Russula. It was taken out of uh, Russula and put in the genus Multiferca. And the interesting thing about it, the, the, uh, all the members in this genus, uh, their, their spore print is a deep um, orange yellow color, deep orange color. And the original description of this, the odor that this one was described as having was lemon scented Lysol. And it was scribed from, uh, I think West Virginia, but I've seen it in Arkansas, I've seen it down uh, Mississippi and other places. So I know it's, it occurs not too uncommon in other Southeastern states. Okay, many of y'all are probably familiar with the parasitic uh, Ascomycete called uh, um, Hypomyces. That this one, they grow on Rushulas and Lactarius. Most people seem to find them on white colored Rushulas. Here's an example of some that I found in North Carolina several years ago, nice, nice robust ones. What you may not know is there's also a green uh, species uh, of it also called Luteovirens. That also that will grow on rustulas. Not as big, not as robust as the, the red, but kind of a novelty uh, if you find them. They're kind of interesting to, to look at. Okay, uh, we're gonna look at the two genera like Arius and like the flus, just a few minutes. And again, uh, this is a book that the Bassettes have uh, published called Milk Mushrooms in North America. It's uh, a, a good one. It's, it's another good Bassett book. You want to get it? I, last time I looked, it was kind of expensive. It's it's been around for a while, maybe 2014 or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but but uh, you know, if you have the money and you can find it, well, you can find it at a lower price. Obviously, I, I would recommend you get it. Uh, in the summer, we found these things, uh, these white uh, uh, milky cow mushrooms uh, called lactoflus, and the Identifying feature for these two is that the gills are really compact. It's, it's white on top. It has somewhat of a central uh, depression in the, the middle of the cap. But if you turn it over, you can see the gill spacing is just super crowded right there. The difference between these two, the Glaucessians and the Piperatus, is the literature says that the Glaucessians, the latex after about 30 minutes will change to a slightly olive or slightly greenish tinted uh, color, whereas with uh, Piperatus, it will not change colors, it will stay white. Both of them are incredibly acrid. 
uh, which doesn't cook out. So most people don't don't eat them because they're just too too peppery. Another one that we see it's fairly common called Lactobacillus subvalurius, variety subdistance is just the opposite of the one I showed you before in the gill spacing. These have uh, uh, almost or distantly spaced gills right there. It's uh, latex is white when it comes out, it may go to sort of a cream color, but it is also incredibly acrid, cannot be eaten. The good news is, yes, we do have some uh, species of lactoflus in the summertime that, that are edible. Um, somebody called these the three amigos. They're closely related. I sort of thought that was a neat, neat byline or, or, or sound bite. So I, I grabbed it and I started using it. So these three are called Lactoflus volemus, Lactoflus carugus, and Lactoflus hygrophoroides over here. Um, the latex will come out, it will be white when it's, uh, when it first come out, when it first comes out, it will stain the uh, gills, this sort of brownish, uh, deep brownish color. It will also stain your fingers the same color if you happen to be picking them or get the latex on your fingers and it's hard to wash off. You have to keep it for a, as a souvenir for probably a couple of days. The carugas, uh, and they also have what's called a fishy odor to them, by the way. The carugas has a little bit more corrugated or wrinkly cap on the top than the, the volemus. The hygrophoroides is the smallest of the three, but people say it tends to be a little bit tastier than, than the other two. So these occur in the summertime and sometimes you can find quite a few of them, but that's what I call the three amigos, Volemus carugus hygrophoroides. Here's another lactarius called Argillacea folius right here. It sort of has a lilac colored cap and uh, the latex is white when it comes out, but it will, the latex will color a brownish color uh, on the gills. It, uh, the latex itself doesn't change colors, but when it hits the gills, it causes the gills to change to a, a sort of a brownish color. It is not edible, it's, it's incredibly accurate. Some other ones that you'll see there in the summer, uh, Lactaria subvernalis, uh, variety cocori. The cap color is a little bit darker than what you see here, but the latex is white when it comes out, but it causes the gills to develop a, a pinkish color like that. They are also not edible. Subplanthagalus is similar to um, subvernalis, but the gills are more distantly spaced. It does the same reaction on the gills or turn a pinkish color, deep pinkish color. It also is not edible. One more, like Caris imperceptus, uh, so-called name because it doesn't have really any salient features or anything that would, would you could latch onto that would identify it easily, but it's fairly common in our woods also, not edible. Okay, we have the summer oysters and we have the winter or fall oysters. These are the summer oysters right here. Most people apply the name Pleurotus pulmonarius. Pulmonarius is the name given because a lot of times these, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? The individual caps will sort of jaunt out, look spatulate or sort of, they're supposed to resemble the, the appearance of a human lung. That's where the pulmonarius name comes from. These are not really showing that, but they, uh, this oyster is usually pure white. It tends to be smaller in size than the, the winter or uh, uh, fall oyster. It has a lookalike that I call the fall summer oyster, which is in the genus Crepidotus. As you see, the uh, caps are pure white. They tend to be smaller in size, but people still find these and and post on the Facebook groups that are these oysters and no, they're not. Easy to tell the difference between the two. If you do a spore print, these will have a white to uh, lilac tinted uh, colored spores underneath. These will have, even though the gills will be pure white when they're young, as they age, the spores, which are brown, start to develop. So if you do a spore print, you will see they have brown spores. So that's the easiest way to, to uh, distinguish between the two. Uh, we have this uh, large polypore called Moripolis sumstinii. Many people find these in the hot summer months thinking they found the myotaki, the Grifola flandosa. They get all excited and uh, then they get uh, the big letdown when people tell them, no, you, it's not the 
It's not the Grifoldo frondosa. It's not the myotoxin. It's this thing. Um, and st uh, there's a uh, mushroom I'll show you in a few minutes called chicken of the woods. It's latiferous. And myotoxin is called hen of the woods. So uh, to carry on with this humorous nature, Michael Quo has dubbed these maybe rooster of the woods. If you know his website, my, uh, mushroomexpert.com, and you look up this name here, uh, he will he will whimsically call them. Maybe we should call these rooster of the woods. He he suggests. Okay, the, even though this is called the cauliflower mushroom, to me it looks more like a head of lettuce. I'm not sure why people want to call it the cauliflower, but it looks like a head of lettuce. In eastern uh, in the southeast, we have two uh, species. The most common one is the Sparassa spatulata. You will find it growing at the they, uh, around stumps of old hardwoods, the trees cut down or they're dying, or every once in a while you may find one growing next to a, a dead pine tree. But most of the time they're associated with the hardwoods. They're okay, people eat them, but, but to me the, the texture is, is pretty rough, it's, it's tough, uh, people may put them in soups. But if you find something that looks like this and it's growing at the base of a pine tree, then I will suggest you found what many people consider to be a choice edible. This is the other species in the Southeast. This is called Sparassus americanum. And it's softer in its texture. It look, has more of a look like a collection of noodles that have been bound together. So look, if you see something like this, it looks like a head of lettuce under hardwoods, you know, you can check it out. But if you definitely see something like this, uh, uh, more newly like, more tender around a pine tree. If it's in good shape, then you may have found yourself a good find. We have coral fungi in uh, the summertime. I can't really, the time won't allow me to talk much about them, but I'm sure all of y'all have, have seen them. This particular one, uh, Artomyces growing on wood. It, yeah, it, I've seen it before, so I'll just move on. One mushroom you probably do need to learn if you don't know it already, so you won't eat it because it will cause severe GI upsets. It's called chlorophyll and molybdites. And it's called chlorophyll because chloro is ind indicative of uh, a green color. Phyllum would be indicative of a, a gill. And the other name for it is called green gills or some, some uh, books call it the vomiter meaning because it causes you to vomit. And um, they sometimes occur in fairy rings or partial fairy rings and in well manicured lawns, sometimes in fields. I've seen them in the, uh, the middle of the interstates, the medians going down, traveling south or whatever in the summertime. When you first pick it, the gills will be pure white. The, the spores have not developed yet. But if you do a spore print or if you find some older collections, you should see a greenish gray color. And that's your indication that that one should not be eaten because it will cause severe GI upset. Okay, so um, we, we've got a few more slides uh, to show you. We've gone from spring, I've shown you the summer ones, and now we're gonna quickly look at some fall mushrooms. Even though fall's the biggest season, as I said, I'm not gonna throw a lot of them out here, but I'm gonna show you some, some fairly good edibles and a, a few other interesting ones before we leave, before I finish tonight. So here's the ones I list as choice edibles and we'll just we'll just go through and I'll show you. Them. Many of y'all, people are still finding these uh, uh, on the Facebook group. I saw one guy that found a 21 pounder in Arkansas uh, a couple of days ago. So this is Aricia marinaceus. It can be grown commercially, you can buy kits that the, the uh, mycelium's inside the substrate and poke holes in the plastic and, and get it to fruit. Uh, they are considered to be choice edibles. Somebody mentioned earlier on, I was listening to make uh, faux crab cakes out of them. That's a good way to fix them. There's also belief that uh, uh, consuming them will, will maybe help generate uh, nerve cells. They, they've been shown in uh, the Petri dish that uh, components from them can generate new nerve cells. So there may be some use for them in, in looking at maybe treating or slowing dementia in, in people. So that's what we call a twofer. It's a choice edible that may have medicinal properties uh, to it also. So this is all Erinaceus. Another species we have is Coralloides. 
many times they will spread out laterally on at the base of uh, old logs, you know, hardwood trees and logs. So that's that's a pretty one right there. Both of them considered to be choice edibles. Many, this is what's called the chicken of the woods, uh, the Tiferous sephiris, also called the sulfur shell. Uh, it's usually a fall uh, uh, mushroom. The one on the right, usually I, well, actually I see it spring, summer, and fall now. Uh, some people are still finding it. It's called a Tipper Cincinnatus. Uh, the one on the left, the Sephirius underneath, if you turn it over and look at the uh, pores underneath, they will be yellow colored, for one thing. It has yellow coloration on the edge of its uh, fronds there. It grows laterally or sometime uh, up uh, above the uh, each other is stacked, I should say, stacked on, on wood, usually hardwood. This one grows in rosette formation that spreads out at the base of hardwoods, usually oak trees. And the one on the right is considered to be the choicer one because the flesh of it, uh, most of the flesh of it can be eaten. It's, it's, it's tenderer than the one on the left. But people use them uh, in place of uh, meat, use them in place of chicken and casseroles. And you can make, um, you can make, I've had people that make uh, uh, chicken fried strips out of them, eating them that way. Uh, Grifola frondosa is also called the mayataki. It's one, uh, uh, it's considered to be a choice edible and have medicinal properties also. It grows in uh, clustered, uh, uh, it's, it's all bound together. As you can see, this is the stalk. And it, it forms the little fronds, the little shelves that go out. But it grows at the base of uh, 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 hardwoods, usually sometimes oaks, and it seems to prefer red oaks. It seems to be more common in the northern parts of states. Missouri has more than Arkansas, but I have seen pictures uh, sparingly of uh, examples of it in, in uh, the deep part of the southeastern states. Uh, uh, Tennessee and North Carolina seem to have a, a good population of them out there, but maybe because of the mountainous regions, cooler temperatures, but it seems to, to like cooler temperatures than, than warm temperatures. Uh, the winter oysters, the examples here, they tend to be larger than the summer oyster, and they also have brownish and sometimes grayish colorations on top of the cap. And people uh, find those. This picture, I think, was taken in late November or maybe even December in Arkansas. And people, some people are still finding them up into the, the freeze. We got freezing temperatures in Arkansas a couple of days ago, so it's probably going to cut the uh, fruiting off for a while anyway. Uh, hidden them, these little things called hedgehogs. Uh, the one on the left, not sure what the species is. The one on the right is called hidden them albo magnum. Uh, it was uh, the the scry It was um, collected and described from material in uh, Alabama. Can't remember where, but it tends to be a big white one. Uh, sometimes those caps can get about five inches across. So these are somewhat related to the chanterelles. They have a very nutty uh, taste to them and uh, they're, they're fun to eat. They're, they're good, good things to eat. Check something, okay. Uh, this is what people call the bluet because of the color, the, the uh, lavender type colors it makes. So the name is called a pistonuda. Sometimes you find them growing in mulch. Uh, sometimes you find them growing in cedar needles. I found a big collection where old cedar uh, needles from cedar trees had deposited. But they're they're saprophic. They're they're not ectomycorrhizal. Uh, there are some uh, mushrooms in the genus Cortinarius that also have some of these same colorations. So a spore print will will tease out which one is a cortinarius, which one is a, a bluet. The uh, spore print on this one would be sort of a, a pinkish buff type coloration, not a deep brown as you would see in members of the cortinarius. We have our honey mushrooms. I'm showing you three different uh, species of that. This is a traditional honey mushroom called Armillaria melia. Uh, the melia comes from of, of, of bees. It, they're not called melia because they're sweet. They're, they, they're not sweet like honey, but because of the yellow color that uh, reminiscent of uh, packet tunny, and you put it in a jar, it's sometimes that color. So here's two examples. Uh, most of them in the Southeast will grow on uh, hardwood trees. Uh, this particular species considered to be pretty 
a pretty strong uh, parasitic mushroom. It will attack living trees by virtue of sending its rhizomorphs in the soil to other living trees. So it's con considered pretty, pretty virulent. Uh, this one used to be called Armillaria tobescens. Uh, you may uh, recognize that name, but a recent name change. Again, DNA showed that Armillaria, what was called Armillaria tobescens is a European uh, mushroom and they had to uh, look around for a new name for the American version. So this is now called Desarmillaria cespitosa. And the cespitosa uh, name fits because they are fused at the base. They grow clustered or said to be cespitose. Here's two examples here. A lot of times in the, the deep south, we see versions of them that are lighter than the traditional ones on the left. They tend to be smaller in color than the melia and uh, Usually the caps are the best part to, to eat on these. Now the stems tend to be very fibrous and you don't want to overload your system with too much uh, uh, chitin or too much bulk. The third one that's called the late fruiting honey mushroom is either Gallica or um, um, what is the other name? Oh, Jemina, Jemina, excuse me. Uh, what we have in Arkansas seems to be the Gallica, but it, I was at a foray in North Carolina back in September and somebody was pointing out that uh, Jamino may occur in parts of the, the mountainous area of North Carolina. So I, they look uh, fairly, um, uh, resemble each other greatly. They, they look alike, but there is a subtle difference that somebody pointed out to me that you could tell uh, Jemina from uh, uh, Gallica, but we've seen a lot of collections of Gallica in late fall. They, they tend to come out when the other two are already gone. And since we talked about the honey mushrooms, we'll talk about a mushroom that parasitizes the honey mushroom. This is called the Entoloma abortivum because it forms aborted fruiting bodies and it's actually parasitic on the honey mushrooms. It's also called shrimp of the woods. Uh, why? I don't know. I don't think it's because of the flavor. I don't think it's because of the odor. So, but that's one of its common names. And what it does, it uh, this is its native form right here. This is the entoloma where it hasn't parasitized. But when it gets a hold of the mycelium of the honey mushroom, it uh, causes the uh, fruiting bodies of the honey mushroom to abort. And the mushroom, the entoloma is using it for their food source, and it forms these aborted fruiting bodies. They have a mealy aroma to them, by the way, it's sort of uh, like cornmeal, and people do eat them. They cook them up and eat them. And uh, like I said, I'm not showing a lot of the fall mushrooms because of time, but I did want to throw this Amanita in. Uh, Persicina, it's our, one of the relatives of the famous Amanita muscaria, which is limited in its distribution in North America. But people have been finding these are associated with pine trees in, in the south and southeast. So I did want to throw that in. And getting close to the end, I'll show you one, what, what, uh, yeah, I want to show you this one, which is, can cover, um, what am I trying to say? The fruiting bodies are very uh, photogenic. Uh, they're large, they're colored uh, deep yellow orange. And sometimes as you can see, uh, the slide on the left, they can spread out. They're growing on buried roots of this uh, hardwood tree. And uh, they're called the jack-o'-lantern mushroom for two reasons. One reason is that uh, the color, the deep orange color, reminiscent of maybe the color of pumpkins. And the other reason is the gills are bioluminescent. And if you've never seen this phenomena yet, I hope you may find some of the jack-o'-lantern in the near future. And take them into a dark room, let your eyes adjust, and you should be able to see evidence that they are bioluminescent. And with that, as I say, I could go on and on, but uh, I think this is a good time to end it right here. So thank you for listening.